Welcome back to the Unreal Engine live stream. I'm Amanda Bott, and I'll be joined by Andrew Hurley and Chance Ivy today. Hey, everyone. How's it going? What's up, guys? So we're going to do a little bit of news, but uh, today's stream will be mostly run by Andrew. He's going to be discussing post-processing oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, with us. Fun. Yeah. I'm going to knock that out of the park. Glad to have you back on, man. Thank you. Thanks yeah, for yeah. being we're here. excited Welcome to have you. Welcome, so. Amanda. Thank I'm sure you. the community welcomes you mm. as well. So <laughs> she's, uh, Glad she, to have you here. Apparently, she needs to go on the slide. Yeah. Oh. I have a, lot of, a oh. lot of smack talk about not having been down the slide. That's so. right. We'll make it happen. We'll get there. Yeah, we'll get, get there. there. But cool, cool. first, the news. Dun, dun, dun. We need like dun, one of those dun, like you know chimes like where it separates and things like that. <laughs> All right. So on our list today, we're going to talk. Uh, we have Develop in Brighton coming up. It's the July 11th through 13th. Uh, there's just a huge conference, tons of game devs, indies, triple A's, yeah. all kinds of folks showing up. Uh, cool. Have you ever been? I've never made it over. No, no Dana, Dana you know, goes and represents for mm -hmm. the U.S. side of the world. It's uh, Most of our European team is there. So Mike Gamble, Jess, of course, all you've probably seen here, here on the live stream or on yeah. Twitter or writing blogs, like the one that we're looking at right here mm -hmm. as well. So uh, they'll all be out there. And uh, yeah. there's some other stuff happening too, right, at the show? Yeah, so if you're there, uh, we have our Developing Beyond competition. Uh, we partner with Welcome. And so we have, it's a year-long competition, but... There oh, are wow. six semi-finalist teams there that will be representing Unreal Engine and this program. And they're going to be judged at the conference. And the top three teams will receive $60,000 of funding wow. to continue monies. developing wow. through January. That's so great. Jeez. That's a nice there. little chunk of change for developing. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So, um, and if you want to read more about those teams, we have Jess wrote up this nice blog post and kind of talks about each of the teams that are still there and the nice. games they're working on. So definitely dive into her blog post to find out more information about that. Uh, yeah, we'll awesome. Also, if you want to read more, developingbeyond.com uh, really lays out the program nicely and you can take a look at that. Nice. Nice. Uh, so yeah. A cool program. It's kind of cool to see it come to a head. You know, we've been working on it for some time. We announced it not long back. And uh, you know, I just I wish I was there to to check it out and meet all the teams. Yeah, some of them, some of them we know we we've seen at other shows and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it's talented folks there. Yeah, I'm sure they're all working on something pretty awesome. So good luck to everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. And yeah, if you're there, make sure to go say hello to Dana or Jess, and I'm sure they'd love to hear what you're working on or absolutely, you know, call it out to us, and we can retweet and be like, hey, yeah, check out these awesome people cool that are there. Like, yeah. So yeah, yeah, uh, that's develop. And then uh, the next thing we wanted to talk about briefly is we have our first community stream on Tuesday. Yeah, and Clint, you can kill the the share if you want for right now. For a moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, the, <laughs> the share. share. Yeah, the, the, the share. screen. The screen. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> kill the no chair. Don't take my chair from me, please. <laughs> Clint, kill your chair. <laughs> now. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. He's, he's standing on the floor. It's okay. You're so mean. I know. Uh, yeah. No, so our first community stream is on Tuesday. We're going to do, um, s we'll be hosting Celeste, nice. and she's going to do a nice stream on UMG. So she's going to talk about creating dynamic uh, GUIs or inventory systems based on arrays of actors and things like that. So um, definitely join in, support her, check her out, and see what she's doing. Super on relevant. Tuesday. Super and relevant for all game designers. You're going to have UI somewhere. <laughs> yeah. You got to learn it. For better force, that's okay. one of the one of the more challenging yeah. things to work through. It so I think it'll be, be valuable here. And just for those that may have missed last week, we uh, we made an announcement that we're going to be rolling down from this studio, um, just doing one live stream a week on Thursdays. It'll be a mix of some of the newest, hottest features that are coming out in each release, some of the cool things that we're doing at events, new product releases, things like that. Uh, and then we'll be doing other things that are a little bit heavier deep dives or getting started content on either those new features or on more generally applicable things like we're doing today. Yeah. So look out for that. Um, in the meantime, we'll actually have a lot, a number of our community folks who do a lot of live training, other areas, they do videos uh, on YouTube and the whatnot. We'll be uh, pushing those out on Tuesdays around the same time at two o'clock. Um, so Celeste is the first one uh, that we'll be kicking off next week and cool. expect to see more of that. Best of luck to her as well. Yeah, yeah. sure. I'll be there. Yeah. <laughs> Sweet. Yep. Uh, can we cut back, Clint? To the community spotlight. Yeah. The people. Oh, I'm excited for this one. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> so first off. We're going to talk about karma. Oh, dun, yeah. Dun, dun. So basically, you do a bad thing. A bad thing probably happened to you at some Later point. Later in life or right. immediately. Who knows? Yeah. Right? 
Actually, yeah. this is more about answering. Yeah, this is okay. Yeah, this a little is, bit. All right. Little. People so being awesome. For those folks that are answering questions and being really active on Answer Hub, um, we hand out these karma points if you're not familiar, and we like to give a shout out to all those community members that are doing a really great job um, and really helping us out. And so we have Ninjin with 325 karma points. Mm, Wasn't oh, he top of the list bit. last week too? Uh, I don't recall, but I've seen him there before. Well, I've definitely sure. seen him. Um, Hailstone Ryan, 202. Right. Noctmar, Death Ray, Dare Purple Helmet. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, well said. All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not sure why that was funny. Is that Redbox? Yeah. yeah awesome. The Redbox. Like, like the, the, the company. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, yeah. I don't they're, they're, they're jumping yeah. in. Uh, Vertigo 23, Amp Dev, Aller's been active this week. I wonder week. who that, that could, could be. be. Pete. I wonder who that yeah. could be. And Pure Pop. Cool. So thank you all so much for jumping in and helping us out. And now we got some spotlight folks. Yeah. Sweet. On to, oh, I think we have a video. Yeah, can you play Ooh. a video for us? Dun, dun. Vector so Fields. Video Joe Wintergreen, time. as sounds like many of you are keeping an eye on his work and seeing what he's done previously, but he made this VR vector field painter uh, where you can just jump in your Vive or your Oculus and sort of navigate these fields that way and, and manipulate them. And to me, that's just a way more intuitive process and yeah much more natural feel for sure i'd be yeah I'd, I'd love to get in here and test this uh in a vr device here and you know it's i love how it's titled impromptu like it he just like <laughs> you know i'll just throw this together <laughs> like well done joe thank you this is a really awesome way to paint vector fields in vr like yeah. oh, i'm sure you've seen some of his other work too like the propagation yes. like the ladder system yeah the ladder system things. yeah just rando tools that are really big time savers what when I first saw this, the thing that stood out to me was like, imagine you want vector or particles to go up against a piece of geometry and then react around it. You actually get in VR and actually paint what that vector yeah. is going to look oh, like yeah. around. Like, say you want snow to kind of go over a rock yeah. if it's wind exactly. blowing, so you it's want it to kind of react example. to it right in that specific mm -hmm. area. Oh god! <laughs> oh god! <laughs> yeah. He did appear. Oh lord! There he is, and uh, his, his pupils, pupils dilate too. Yeah. Yeah. Real hard. So Thank you, Joe. <laughs> for that, that creepy guy. Yeah, but that's yeah. a really cool, cool implementation. Thank you. For I that. would just love being able to like jump in, and then you can get a way better feel for mm -hmm. the shapes you want and kind of find those. The little tornadoes. Those yeah, yeah. It feels more organic. Uh huh. Yeah, it's great. All right. Cool. So then, after Joe, we wanted to give a shout out to Alessa Baker. She's oh been yeah. working mm -hmm. on uh, UE4 Live. Um, and it's just it's a community of Unreal Engine 4 live stream streamers or folks that are interested that want to jump into it, and it's all it's just a place for people that love to stream about Unreal Engine. And yeah. there's a whole Discord community where a lot of folks are jumping in and you know sharing their tips and discussing mm -hmm. these things. And I just wanted to give a huge shout out to her. I know it takes a lot of work to get up to put a website up and yeah, to curate sure. and herd cats of people, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, and, definitely. Uh, so I know she puts a lot of work into this and um, we just really wanted to, to highlight her. Cause it's cool to see a lot of like mediums come out like this where you have, you know, the idea of like sort of open source gaming where you have, you know, just the community sharing ideas and you guys are actually like developers who are able to look face to face and, you know, just be like, hey, what are you working on? I'm doing this. Oh, cool! Check it out. Here's yeah. my th addition to this, or whatever. You know, it's a it's a really cool way. So thank you for helping manage the medium that allows people to do that. There's a lot, lot of great streamers on here already. You know, Alyssa's been part of this community since forever, right? You know, always involved in something else, and this is just one more initiative that I think is going to add a lot of value. I mean, we've got our live streams here. Mm -hmm. um, we've got some training from our our people that we're going to have on Tuesdays, and then this is just just in general, like the every, everybody out there making amazing yeah. things. So if you want to watch people uh, build things, ask questions to other developers, this is a good place to do it. I like to look at this as sort of an MMO, like it's a persistent world of constantly <laughs> streaming people <laughs> designing. So if like, even if you're tired, get on there and you might, you know, so see someone who's just streaming game design randomly and you'll, you'll catch something and learn. So yeah, and I'm, it. it's just really exciting to us that we have such an active and wonderful community. Like this is all done by them. We're not involved other than being like, "Yay, we Driving love it, guys!" It. Yeah, but right. golf claps, like, we're but hands good off golf claps. Right? Yeah. There we go. Good job. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well done. And then, last but not least, this week we're talking about Victor Omen. Mm. Oh yes. Um, or er Ermin, and in general, he has a lot of really amazing stuff. Wow. 
on his art station if you want to check it out. Um, Homebound. He has a number game. of tutorials, and these scenes are really gorgeous. But what I wanted to give a huge shout out for um, is he just got highlighted for this animated vegetation. Uh, Ooh, and he nice. actually does a tutorial where he walks through and you can kind of see the different parts of the process and what kind of materials and assets you need to make to get oh, yeah. this really beautiful scene. So if you haven't checked out his stuff, I highly recommend it. It's really gorgeous. Yeah. And yeah. I'm guessing he probably uses some world position offset to push the, the grass around and make it move and stuff. It looks cool, though. And I mean, even the thumbnail, it looks really high quality. So Well, you yeah. can... Jump on later and, and oh, learn how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Sweet. I like your ass. He'll so show you go. exactly how to do it. Cool. Which has been great. You know, I remember we were first chatting with him, uh, him on working uh, in VR, you know, using some of the Quixel tools and whatnot and built homebound just from like in the oh, yeah. toying around the, in his house, you know, or like at his desk. And uh, so seeing seeing Sherry, seeing some of the techniques here shared are, are super awesome and yeah. super valuable. So Quixel super the, high fidelity. Yeah, mega scans, stuff, just yeah. wonderful, wonderful. Really nice there. stuff. Let's go and, that, and that's up on 80 level as well. So yeah. I'll be dropping a lot of these links into chat uh, right after this too. So if you want to check these out on your end, um, yeah, watch out for that. Do those things. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, that's all our news and spotlights for today. Great. Oh, mm -hmm. One quick reminder, too, if you want to be on Community Spotlight, find a way to reach out to us, whether it be on Twitter, whether it be in the forums, post your stuff places, tag UE4 on your on your social posts. Uh, we're kind of looking out everywhere for all kinds of great things, and we're um, all you know, the time. really excited to highlight things. We're just continually impressed with what we find. I mean, like all kinds of wonderful, wonderful, wonderful content out yeah. there. So thanks, everybody, for being awesome. Thank you. Yes, awesome. Now it's your turn. Oh, it's my turn to be in the spotlight? Yeah. Oh, great. I gotta there you go. go. All the talking and dun, stuff. Dun, dun, uh. It's okay. You guys can help <laughs> break that up. All right, so hey, everybody. Um, Chance, I'm going to steal this and pull this All over. All yours. Um, as you know, I'm going to preface real quick. Uh, we're doing post-processing, like a lot of my other streams that I've uh, been on for. This is going to be sort of a... Uh, getting started, so um, getting you acclimated with just post-processing in general, um, understanding, you know, what it is, how to manage it, how to use tools in the engine to better get the look that you want. Um, there are some things in here that are more in-depth that I won't be able to touch on as much. Um, things like custom depth, I will go over um, post-process materials, stuff like that, but uh, as I was telling Amanda, you know, that could be an entire stream in itself, um, and there's a lot of content there. So I'm going to just kind of briefly go through it, um, and uh, I think one of the big things about this stream and all the other ones that I've, I've been doing, to be honest, is, is using the resources you have that uh, we give you to uh, reverse engineer and understand uh, these things. And uh, one of the best projects to get a very good high-level understanding and even a, a pretty granular understanding of some of the things in the engine is the content examples. Um, you know, we have, it's constantly being updated and um, like, for example, when I, when I wanted to learn about um, uh, parallax occlusion mapping, uh, Brux did a great addition to that project and added in the map and, you know, I learned a good bit on just how to manage that. Um, so. Content examples. Um, that is a great way to kick it off. <laughs> Let's close that. I do not need fair. VR. Yep, I don't need that. Um, and I also have, where did you go, those notes? They are right here. Or they're right here. So I'm going to share these with you before we get into it. Um, I'm going to share these with the, the community at the end of the stream. These are just links, and we're going to go through this a little bit. I just highlighted the main points, and there's links to the documentation, so it'll quickly take you there. Um, quick little synopsis and breakdown of That's each. That's great. Yeah, it's yeah. It, just so you can easily navigate it. So what I'm going to do, this is the content examples map, if you guys aren't familiar. Um, and I'm going to... Um, go into the content browser. I usually what I do is I'll create like a little level filter just so I can quickly filter out to the, all the levels and then do a search. So I know the name of this map, post processing, and we're just going to get get started here. Um, now originally, and that that was taken out, um, I think with the 414 maybe or maybe even 413, uh, anti aliasing used to be controlled in post process volumes. Not so much anymore. Um, it's more of a project setting um, that, that you control through the project rendering settings. Um, and I'll show you that. But anti aliasing is, is also another topic that 
you know, I'll, I'll tell you, obviously, if you don't know Annie Allison, I can give you a brief rundown, but it's one of those topics that can get really more involved and you can talk about the different types and how they work, um, and we're not going to get into all that. Um, but essentially, um, so when you go, actually, let's start with this. Let's just answer and tell you guys what is post-processing, right? And in, in, in my summary, I was thinking about this last night when I was working, and it's, it's sort of like, think of post-processing as a way to confine um, essentially all the cool little after effects once your, your scene has been rendered initially. That's why it's called post-processing. It applies these effects, ef effects at the end of basically the rendering pass. After everything else. Yeah, exactly. And you can contain these effects in, uh, by using volumes. And essentially, think of volumes as uh, uh, much like uh, other passes and things in the engine as sort of layers, right? And these layers can be layered on top of one another, and you can blend in between two different volumes and you know, have totally different effects. So um, it's, it's a good way to think about it in that manner. Um, so with that in mind, um, we'll just go straight into it. Now, when you open or start any new default project, um, if you want to look at how, like, basically your base uh, rendering settings will be handled, you go to Open Project Settings, um, go down to Rendering, and uh, it's essentially nested under Engine. And then you'll see you have a bunch of these other ones that we're not going to really discuss. But under default settings, this is where you're going to handle uh, anti-aliasing. And um, just a quick definition of anti-aliasing, it's just a way to smooth out the, the stair step effect on, uh, on your image, right? It's just a, uh, a method that's used, and there's a bunch of different methods to just smooth out uh, you know, your image. Jagged edges, right? Exactly. Like, yeah. Jagged edges, yep. Because um, pixels. Because pixels, indeed. Because <laughs> pixels and non-straight lines. Um, and we actually, the forward render that we introduced for VR, uh, we have the MSAA, which does a good job for hard surface and sort of like building type. It uh, uh, does a good job of smoothing that out, but sometimes has issues with organic. So having an understanding of what these AA methods do, what they handle, what you're working with, is, is a good way to kind of feel out what you want to what, what you want to use. Um, but that's just a quick uh, look at the default settings. Um, and that is highlighted here. So if I you know press play, obviously there's a each one of these um, caution areas indicate uh, an area where there's a volume. So I'm going to walk in here. Nothing happens, right? This is our global, what we call the global post-process volume. Now this one is, um, I think this one might be bound. So let's type unbound. Yeah, so this one is actually confined to this space. Um, and what you can do is... Uh, most people, uh, or what I do and w what I've seen a lot of people do, is they'll take a, uh, a global post-process volume, so drag it into a scene, set it as unbound, and use that to determine just like the universal, you know, mm -hmm. your post-processing in the level, and then you can add more volumes on top of it and say, hey, like, now that I have an unbound volume, this one's actually bound to its uh, box wireframe. Once I get close to it or get inside of it, those effects take hold. Um, and it's it's a really cool way to sort of manage how you want to do post processing. So yeah, so um, that is just your default settings. That's not going to do much. Um, we'll get right into the first topic. Now this one, um, this one is pretty. We're going to skip these really quickly. Where's Bloom? Here, there you are. Bloom's really cool, and it's a great way to add realism. Bloom is essentially just the effect um, of the real real world phenomenon where you um, essentially you have a light that's really bright and sort of uh, t encompassing a lot of the shot you know it's it's uh, it's I, I'm trying to think of a better way to say really bright without <laughs> like you know it's overly bright. yeah overly bright in a way um, none, more, none more bright yeah exactly <laughs> it's like sort of the c what the camera perceives like our eyes using um, uh, our eye adaptation, we can sort of account for bloom, but there's still bloom in your peripherals if there's, for example, these bright lights up here, you know, they're actually emitting a, sort of a radius that you can't really see by the visible light spectrum, but it's there and it's, it's causing a, a realism effect. And you can simulate that in Unreal. Um, and there's different ways to handle and manage that. So uh, what they've done in the content examples, which is pretty cool, is they've given you different types of bloom. So you have this uh, straightforward one, and as you can see, there's a little lens effect here, and that's essentially just what they've done is they've taken a texture and just overlaid it on top of the the um, the camera essentially, and 
as bloom comes through the camera, those areas will be sort of masked out and have a, uh, give you variation in brightness, which really can simulate, like, especially if you're doing cinematics or something like that's supposed to create a mood or like, you know, is anything around that, that's a really good way to do that. And you can actually, so what I'll do is I'll type bloom here and let's click on this first volume and I'll show you um, immediately when I click on it, you see that these have been modified and they've changed the size, scale, and tint, and all that fun stuff. I can really uh, crank this up if I wanted to. That's actually just the bloom itself. Notice how that's going up and, up and down. But I'm going to go to the mask here. Here's the texture. This is simply just a dirt texture. And I think this is in the engine, and I'll show you a test project that I did. But this is in the engine. Um, so like, just make a cr blank project, expose the engine content, and this will be there for you. Um, so you can use that. Um, so they set it at 500. I can really make it intense by doing like, let's do 10,000. I know that's crazy, but uh, well, maybe if I Will can. Will you move for them? Okay. Yeah. Run. Okay, cool. Cool. So you know, cranking up that intensity, it's really you know, it's really in your face. But now it's more apparent, right? Like, so this would be cool if for an astronaut game where you're, like, you're breathing, the humidity starts to build up and other, other effects start to build up over time. And you can sort of animate this um, uh, using blueprints as well. So that's, that's pretty cool. And then there's other ways to change bloom. You have like a uh, color and then you can just kind of uh, change the threshold. Uh, so everything sort of fills the screen. All the lights are really bloomed uh, in your face. Um, so I'll actually show you what the threshold can really... Threshold is one of those ones where after you get the bloom setting right, after you feel that out, um, you sort of use the threshold to dial it back. See, the default is negative one. If I set this to zero, it can really take away from the full screen bloom. Notice how those colors are essentially, that blue is taken over. And as soon as I change the threshold, it goes away. You still have this bright bloom here, but you know, you don't have that full screen blue there. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's something to pay attention to when you're working with uh, bloom. Um, bloom can easily get out of control. Um, I've seen, you know, in, in my own experience working with environment art and stuff, it just, you know, you crank up the bloom too much and you look at the sun and now that's taking away from your, you know, the focus that you're trying to bring to the image. So you just kind of be careful and balance it out. And on that same note too, it might be valuable to like think about specifically what you want to do for bloom when you're building your materials as well because you can you know you can control put, that yeah, through emissive and yeah, yeah exactly all and so, of the types you're right so you might might toy, toy around with both of those and kind of understand what you're trying to accomplish before you go in and start cranking settings so if you that's change exactly material right. it might be different that's exactly design, right so, so. yeah yeah it'll be um you know it, like he's saying just find that find that middle ground um, and that kind of works is and is sort of malleable with different scenarios of you know materials that you're using and so on and so forth so yeah bloom pretty pretty straightforward um, pretty easy now there's something that uh, I'm gonna kind of minimize this just for a second and I'm gonna go into um, this post-processing project um, that I made uh, threw it together uh, you know uh, just to Highlight things. I guess it's just. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm the not. You're going to use the Oculus right now. The I apologize. The plugins on currently. Uh, so uh, so yeah. Defaulting. Yeah. Disable it. That's okay. At least I know it yeah. works. <laughs> cool. So um, I, I made my own little thing, and I'll share this with you guys too. It's n it's nothing more. You know, not much different than the content examples map. This is merely me pointing out the powers of Bloom here and uh, different effects that I feel like are important to understand and manage um, because of the easiest to really add realism. So this is Bloom here, and you know, it 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 actually brings a really cool effect. I've cranked up the lens and this and that. So this is the one that is on by default that um, I have often tempted to just enter a feature request to have it disabled by default, but I'm sure there's a reason why it's enabled. Um, auto exposure. So it's essentially your eye's ability and uh, a way to simulate going from dark to light areas. So mm -hmm. I step into a corridor that's really dark. It's going to take some time for your eyes to adjust and vice versa when you step outside. I do it every day when I walk uh, out back in the, the bright white concrete in the building and I'm just like, oh gosh, like let my eyes adjust for a second. Um, so this is a way to simulate that. Now there are um, a number of ways to disable it. Um, and there are, there are ways to disable it that are uh, quote unquote non-destructive. And uh, one of the better ways that I figured out to do it quickly. Um, so as an example, I'll just do new level real quick and show you. Like when I look at this ground, notice how it brightens really quickly. And then I look away, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of people are like, oh, that's, I could, 
you know, go in, add a post-process volume, set the min and max brightness levels to the same range. So it clamps, so, it. Mm -hmm, it, clamps it right to one-to-one. -one. Or uh, this is the way that I've done it. Go to exposure and fixed. And you'll notice now the brightness just stays. Now, this is not going to translate to your game. This is a viewport control that as soon as you package out your game, it's going to automatic default in game. So if you have if you don't have a post process volume, then you will have auto exposure. So um, and then the other way, let's just go right back to the map. We had someone asking um, yeah, what's if up? you tend to leave a uh, little Sarah Lee was asking if you should generally leave your light exposure on auto or do you? Um, honestly, that is up to that is up to what you're working on, what you're designing. So like let's say you're doing arc viz. I would keep auto exposure in because you're shooting for realism, mm -hmm. right? And and you want to, especially when lighting is very important, you want to really gain that realism of going from brighter to dark areas. Um, but I've also seen uh, seen it turned off for ArcViz. So it's all about what you want. You know, you can have a, a sort of a flatter game that doesn't really, it's not using uh, any sort of dynamic lighting in that manner. So. Um, you know, having it disabled will benefit you more, especially if you're working in a game that you want dark areas to be dark and you don't want them to see that. So, um, you know, that's, that's all up to your interpretation as what you're designing for. Um, but this is just a quick example to show you. Um, and all I'm using here is just the exposure bias. So what I have to do is, let's just type auto exposure. There you go. So these are the default settings. Um, 0.3 and 0.2. Now, if I set this to zero, the exposure bias, and I set this to one, this is that other way to sort of disable it. Mm. Now, when I go in, it's you know, no change, right? And that's exactly what you would expect. But if I just do that and change this, and you can do negatives. I usually do it in quarters, like 0.25, negative 0.5, and then you can even go neg uh, negative one. So it makes it even darker, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, uh, auto exposure is a really, really fancy little, little realism trick. Um, and there is actually, uh, there's a histogram. There's two different types. And this is what we're using is the histogram method. Basic is pretty straightforward. I, I believe it avoids the whole histogram method. But I will show you um, the histogram tool and how to just look at it really quickly. So visualize. What you want to do is go to viewport, show, visualize. And let's see, uh, HDR, eye adaptation, boom. So this actually gives you a little graph of, now we want to get in here. Nice. Um, yeah, and it gives you a graph of essentially your bright and low points. And this green area is your min and max brightness. So if I set this to zero, it should go all the way, yep, all the way to the end. Cool. And two will sort of push that green. Oh. So you're sort of capturing, you're looking at the values in here and figuring out like what you want to be in the vis visible spectrum. So that's pretty good, actually. That's not bad. and. The more I push this and move it, right? This is the exposure bias. This is your little blue blue line. It's telling you, okay, this is what it's going to adapt to. See how it starts to line up, and that's the speed at which it meets that uh, blue it, line. The curve. Yeah, the curve. So um, this is something that you just kind of want to feel out and figure out, um, and you can really start to kind of ruin your brightness Experience. levels if you uh, <laughs> yeah if you don't do it correctly so you know do everything in moderation just be careful but this tool is really helpful and the more you understand it and the more you you know mess around with it the better your your brightness uh levels will get uh will be so let's go back to visualize just turn that off and cool we're right back to where we need to be all right and that's auto exposure uh, i'm going to skip over blendables for just a second um Let's go into color grading, um, and this is one of those ones that was touched on um, in a, an entirely separate stream. And uh, color grading is essentially tone mapping. Um, tone mapping mm -hmm. is a way to map s essentially the colors in your project so that they are, um, the best way to put this, adaptable and universally uh, uh, viewed. The colors don't change when you go to different monitors, right? So it's essentially mapping your color range. Um, to make sure that the colors that you want to uh, keep in that project maintain when you go to a different monitor. Um, Got it. So HDR, so stuff like that. And uh, this outline that I am going to be giving you guys, um, I actually have a link to the stream that Brian Karras um, did, and it's very informative. Reasons why we changed to uh, a more filmic tone mapper, um, uh, everything behind that, and uh, I'll show you uh, LUTs, which is lookup tables. 
Um, so, uh, yeah, look up tables. I didn't know what those were for the longest time. That's the pretty default. Cool. Yeah, it, it is very cool. It's a very quick way to define color ranges in your. So let's see. Let's get out of here and cool. So this is color grading. Um, essentially, let's roll this out just a little bit. And as you see um, in the content examples map, as I go through, you know, each each one has a, a very different effect and. Um, uh, this is a really good example of the power of post-processing, doing subtle changes, adding temperature and scene color tint and things like that. And you can really bring it like a sepia mood or like anything like that. Instagram filters. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> your Instagram filters. And, uh, you know, that's, that's something that is, uh, it, it's a good way to get your artistic sense and find your creative direction for whatever project. And usually you have that down before you go in, but you don't always know what it's going to look like. So mm -hmm. you need to kind of feel out, you know, and this is a great way, just quick color grading to figure out, you know, the effect and mood that you want to set for any one particular scene. Um, now, another cool thing about color grading, aside from all the awesome scene color tint and stuff, um, is we have these new um, uh, color picker tools and it really allows you to um, so I, this is the contrast one I believe yeah so I, s I can really increase the contrast or desaturate it and I can use this little little guy which I love it's just it's super user friendly um, to kind of modify so that's a sort of a new addition that I really appreciate everyone working hard to get that in um, tone mapper um, this is essentially uh, oh wow they mess with the mobile tone mapper here cool um, this is essentially what we were talking about. Now, if you want to go back to the old tone mapper, um, we do talk about that in the stream. You essentially enter a console variable r dot tone mapper space zero. It'll disable the new one, and then there's some uh, tone mapper settings that you need to to apply in order to get uh, return to sort of the original tone mapper. If you were, you know, gearing your content towards those uh, previous versions. Um, so yeah, tone mapping really cool, and I think we are missing. Where are you? There's got to be. Let's see. All these awesome settings here. There it is. Color grading. L U T. So, I put this in my own project here really quickly. Um, I'm gonna skip that one. Skip that one. Screen space color. Okay, cool. Um, so what I'm gonna do really quickly here. I think this is just a blendable because we're gonna transition into that really quickly. So let's go down to blendables. And uh, essentially uh, what a LUT is, it stands for lookup table, and it is essentially a 16 by 1 um, texture of <laughs> colors, right? And yep. here's, here is the, this is the one that I actually got from the documentation. I brought it in Photoshop and just did a, a quick, like, levels edit and, you know, modified it. And now I have my own, you know, do unique, you yeah, my own Instagram filter, right? So... I'm going to find this in Content Browser, make it sure it's selected, and I'll show you how quickly. Let's just turn that off. Turn off the blendable and this guy. So I have it selected. All I have to do is uh, apply it, and now I have this cool, like, immediate uh, color grading effect. And I can change the intensity with this slider to really, like, dial it up or tone it back. So um, it's, it's a really fun way, an easy way to see effects. This actually turned out a little bit cooler than I thought it would be. <laughs> um, cool. Um, so yeah, uh, LUTs, look at those. I think there's a couple packs on the marketplace um, for those. Um, but honestly, it's not super hard to alter if you just uh, take it into Photoshop and figure out what you want. Yeah, I have a, a couple of friends who are working on some film, uh, like in UE4, some mm -hmm. animated films. And uh, they've written a bunch of their own that map a lot of like actual film yeah, LUTs. Yeah, and that's that. And so they're actually that's the trying trick. to they're trying to get them to have that authentic film feel. Yeah, and it looks awesome. Yeah, super super cool. Yeah, a good uh, lookup table is really powerful in the in the right hands and with the right direction. Um, yeah, that's awesome. It's cool and it's it it does take some some finite tuning to get a good uh, lookup table. So, um, but you know, figure it out, play around with it. You got it. Make some unique looking uh, stuff. At yeah, least, right? I, I <laughs> believe in you guys. You're, you're awesome. Um, so the next one is depth of field. Um, and this one is highly used um, in a lot of projects. And it's one of those it's one of those ones that I'm actually going to have the documentation open for a second for um, because I believe 
the way that they go about showing you how to visualize it um, is very important and understanding the transition range and setting it up. Um, I was strictly working when I started doing this, I was strictly uh, working with um, bokeh, I guess that's how you want to pronounce mm -hmm. it. I, I know there's a probably more. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, and that's a, th that one's fun because you can have adaptive depth of field and you can actually really see the, um, your layers. And what I mean by that is your transition distances of you have your focal region, which will always be in focus. And the tool that we provide actually colorizes these things so you can visualize and optimize for it. Pretty cool, right? So fancy. Yeah. There's so awesome. many cool it's things you can do. Super awesome. Um, so I'm going to show you guys how to do that. And... Um, and then I'll show you how it correlates in color. So what I'm going to do, I've for this post-process volume, we're using uh, bokeh depth of field. And I've essentially just set up a very simple, let's do depth of field, um, very simple, straightforward uh, method here. And the w one of the more important things about um, depth of field is the scale. Now, this slider here, scale, can quickly um, what does it say? Uh, quickly increase the rendering cost um, because what it's doing is it's applying a blur. Even if uh, the the far scene isn't blurred that much, it's still fully blurring it. So if you crank up the scale, it actually increases the cost um, to render, which I believe is highlighted. Let's see. Yeah, this is the out of all the uh, parts in this documentation. When you do open it up and look at it. Um, this is an important thing to look over, and this is the visualizer. This shows you, um, essentially green is your near, black is the focal distance, so things that are going to be in focus, and blue is going to be uh, your far, and uh, far is usually blurred more, but you know, it's, it's all about what you want, the kind of blur that you're going for, um, the kind of effect you need, because um, you can have really high intensity blurs close to the camera, which is, you know, makes sense for a number of different reasons. So um, let's see. Here's how it breaks. It breaks it down for you. Um, it does a really good job. The documentation does a good job of kind of showing you. Um, and I like to look at it as green is blurred, right? But away from green, going into your focal region, you have sort of a, think of it as your brush fall off. So the, the basically the fall off of transition from fully fully blurred or this area to the next. And you can define those regions um, using settings. And I'm trying to find where it actually mentions uh, scale being, excuse me, being uh, costly. But it is just just keep in mind. And there's ways to get the same effect without having a super high scale by increasing like the max size here and keeping the scale low. If I made it 32, right, that's that's great. But I could also get a similar effect if I just crank up the scale, right? But you kind of want to avoid doing that. So I try and keep scale minimized and work with the other settings first. Um, but here, I'm going to show you the visualizer. And let's do something even more fancy here. Boom. Let's go full screen. That's always fun. Let's see. Depth, oh, depth of field layers here. Cool. So as you can see, my green is very close. It doesn't even oh, show wow, up yeah. until I get really close. Wow, and I did that on purpose to kind of keep, you know, keep things close. Uh, this sort is of a really focus. great visualization. Yeah, tool. it's a it's an awesome visualization tool. Not many people, you know, use it as much. So um, that's that's sort of the reason why I'm I'm doing this stream is to show you the tools that you do have on hand. Um, and now, if we quickly, let's I'm gonna have to pop out a full screen. Sorry, guys. Now, if I change the near transition region. Um, you'll notice that the green actually it becomes very you know a hard a very hard line dense mm -hmm. right yeah and I can actually change the let's see focal distance so I can change the distance in which the entire thing is in focus right so now if I keep it here and let's turn off this visualizer really quickly actually there's a better way to do this instead of me doing that so show flag Flag. Uh, whoops, that's not our dot. It's show flag dot visualize depth of field. Now, what you can do when you do these, um, you can quickly. So now things in the near are, are very blurred, and I still have. Uh, let's see. 
let's change this max near scale. So now there's a clear focal region between mm -hmm. near and far, right? Um, so yes, use this tool to um, fine tune your uh, depth of field. That's really nice. Yeah, it's great. So, um, and this is one that it took me a while to sort of figure out and, and get a hang of, but once I did, it was it was uh, pretty powerful. So let's just bring this back to 300, and yeah, that's fine. Cool. So cool. Yeah, uh, depth of field. Now that's just bokeh, um, and there are two other methods um, which I will talk about very quickly. Um, there is circular which is used more for um, film, used more in film. We used it, I believe the example we have here is the Boy and His Kite, that demo. And then Gaussian is more of a, uh, it, it's sort of a uh, less, I won't say less refined, but it's a lot easier to, in my opinion, to quickly blur the um, background and foreground using less settings. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you won't have the, the the fine tune settings as much, but you know it's it's equally as powerful. Um, it's all about what you much like uh, a lot of the other post processing things I've been talking about. It's all about the content you're gearing it towards, mm -hmm. mm. and you know what works out best in your situation. What your desired effect is. Yeah, exactly. There's and a lot of things too. Talking to Shord years ago, it's like these are the things you want to go click the check boxes, scroll the sliders, yes. and see kind of what effects That's are there. That's exactly. Really, really understand how it's affecting your scene. There's great documentation on it too, but it's very visual with your content. So I think that there's a lot of, you want to get in there and get your hands really dirty with this stuff. Agreed. Well said. Um, yeah, so I mean, this is, it, it's a depth of field. It's, it's a great tool. Um, and one of the things that I think was a question was the performance impact. Now. Um, whenever you're, and I think I spoke about this last time, and I'll do this very quickly, um, evaluating, because there are performance differences between uh, different methods of depth of field. And if I crank up the scale, I'll show you an example here um, as best I can. I'm going to turn off real time. Whenever you're profiling, uh, uh, and Zach did a good job, uh, Parrish did a good job of pointing this out in the VR live stream, especially when you're gearing for VR. Mm -hmm. Test and standalone, turn off real time in the viewport. You know, make sure there is less... Overhead, overhead, yeah, no, it reduces as much overhead as you can. That way, when you go to profile, you know that you're getting the accurate numbers. So what I'm going to do is uh, quickly show you, um, I'm going to run this in standalone. Hopefully, it actually, this is the default level it starts. I believe that will be the case. Um, and then I'll profile the GPU and, and show you sort of the cost of, and now there are other, are other post-process volumes in here, but it'll break that down and show you. Um, at least, I think I did standalone. Did it go? Maybe it's just going in the background. Oh, wow, it's already there. <laughs> oh, look at that. <laughs> cool. Um, so what I'm going to do, and remember, Profile GPU essentially just takes a screenshot of that, um, what's being rendered on the screen at, at that time. moment. So uh, you can do Profile GPU or sh uh, Control Shift comma, Control sh whoa. Uh, control Shift. Ha ha. And Got I'm it. moving, but I was moving, but it's okay. So as you can see, post-processing can get pretty expensive. Now I do have a number of post-process volumes in here, but it will give you a breakdown of depth of field, temporal AA, um, bokeh, depth of field, recombine. So it gives you all of these. Um, That's great. Yeah, it, it's a full breakdown of your scene and what's being rendered on the screen. And this is a good way to see, well, do I really need to have my depth of field this <laughs> intense? Like probably not unless I'm like, coming out of a space coma and I want that to be an effect that, you know, I'm, I can't really see you're or something. You're putting an optomist trick Yeah, yeah. So, you oh, the glasses oh, there you go. Uh, and yeah, near sighted, far sighted. There you go. <laughs> see? Good. But make sure that, you know, it's not killing your processing. Um, so, yeah, that's a, that's a way to profile and that's something that's very important. Um, so make sure that when you do choose a depth of field, you profile it and see how it works. Um, all right, cool. So that was uh, depth of field at a glance. Let's see what we have here next. I think you are here. There you go. There you are. All right, lens flares are pretty straightforward. We don't get too much into that, but it's essentially just uh, explaining the effect um, when you look kind of towards a, a bright light. There's um, and it's similar to Bloom, where you have this sort of uh, this break in the uh, I guess you call it light spectrum in a, in a way, and it breaks apart, and it's being represented in shapes, and you can use those, you can modify those shapes any way you want. You can you can tint them, change the intensity. Yeah, and cat. 
Yep, there you go. <laughs> um, and there was one thing that uh, when, when we were talking about Bloom, that kind of translates to the lens flare kind of stuff. Um, on the Bloom, where are you? Right here. Um, we did a stream. There is a stream on here that talks about um, right at the bottom, we added convolution and we did this awesome yeah, uh, live stream. Yeah, the, the guy's voice was very soothing. It was very enjoyable <laughs> to listen to the guy talk about uh, in a very intelligent manner these uh, this awesome uh, new Bloom features and how they work. And So if you're really interested in that, uh, go check that out because see this little starburst guy here? That's a Bloom effect that was added. So um, check that out. Um, and that's more on Bloom, not lens flares. But... On to the next lens flare is, you know, pretty self-explanatory. This is the one that uh, we're going to get into uh, a little bit more. This is blendables. Now, a post-process volume can uh, actually contain a material, and that material needs to be in a post-process domain. And what that allows you to do is a whole number of effects. Um, you can do uh, get the scene color and multiply the scene color of your scene and control, uh, you know, brightness in that manner. So you can do that to expose settings for your game for like brightness sliders or like contrast sliders or anything like that. So what I'm going to do, I made a very quick uh, post-process material, um, blendable, and I think I disabled it here. So blendable, yep, it's in the array. There we go. And I increased the blend radius. Now this is where blendables and post-process materials become really powerful is when you start to be able to layer them and use blend radius. So see how it smoothly transitions yeah. into that. You're like oh. close to the volume and it kind of eases you mm -hmm. in. And this is just your, this is just the world space uh, distance from the bounds of the wireframe to the essentially the you know, player camera. <laughs> um, so yeah, and what I'll do is I'll show you guys how I manage this. So open it, it up. This is just an instance. So I've created an instance of this material. And what I can do is now I can just create a uh, more intense color. I can reduce it. You know, I can change the color if I want. Um, and you know, there's a very simple effect. And there's way more advanced uh, post-process materials. Actually, a really great example of one is the stylized demo mm, where we have yep. that stencil effect. And that was really cool. And so essentially all this is doing, um, just a very quick run through, I'm taking the post-process input zero, um, which is essentially this, this guy right here, or my, my default post-process, um, that input, and I'm just masking out the RGB channels, so that's just my scene color essentially. Um, and I take a, a vector three, parameterize it, multiply it by um, its own, and then add that to a LERP and I can control how much uh, color is contributed to um, that essentially the mask. And this is an easy one. This was on the examples. Um, this is a uh, really good where, uh, place to start. You can actually use this to blend in between different post-process inputs as well. Um, and that's where the power of blending comes into play. Um, how are we doing on time, by the way? And qu and questions. Do we have any live questions mm -hmm. or anything? We got a few pertinent? things that have, a few things that have come up, but less contextual, so we can just kind of knock them out more. Hold them, hold them off. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Clint, um, how, Clint how are you on time, man? Yeah. How you doing over there? Uh, whenever. Okay. Awesome. I like that answer. Yeah. Cool. Um, <laughs> cool. So. Next, we're going to look at uh, screen space reflections. Now, one of the uh, things about screen space reflections, there's different reflection, reflective methods in Unreal Engine, and com excuse me, combining them will give you your best result. You have the environment uh, reflections using sphere reflection captures, you know, ambient cube maps. You have all that, uh, all that fun stuff. Um, and let's see, there we are, screen space reflections. One of the big ones that I've noticed about screen space reflections, our example, it, kinda, it can get distorted um, with temporal AA, and, and that's just how, how screen space works um, as it is in the engine. And there's ways to modify it. And one of the best ways I've, I've figured to kind of work around some of this distortion, and it's suggested as well, which we do in the... Um, the subway fight scene. There's a lot of reflective materials, and that's a good place to look for uh, reflective examples. Um, but what I've noticed is a good way to break that up is to add sort of a roughness mask, and you still get uh, accurate reflections here, and you see that it's clearly reflecting, but it's breaking that, that up so you don't really notice the um, oh, gotcha. a little bit of distortion, right? And it still has that sort of realist effect, realistic effect, so you could use this for tiles or anything. Um, and one of the cool, another one of the cool things that I actually 
I kind of knew it was a thing, but never really took notice of it. N since this, I, ha I have screen space reflections disabled on the global post process volume. And if you mm. notice, it's not visible here. And as I get closer, it actually comes into play, in. right? And that's, that's a great way to control your reflections and environment and contain them mm. if you don't want certain surfaces to be reflective, but you have a reflective surface, right? Um, so, and, and that was really cool. I was like, oh wow, it's actually like fading in the reflections and fading them out. So it's just like not worried about that at all. Um, so that's another cool little, little guy. Um, pretty straightforward, there are, um, there are controls for it nested inside of the post-process volume, much like all of these other ones. Um, so pretty self-explanatory, uh, fool around with it, figure it out, you'll like it, it's cool. Um, next, screen space ambient occlusion. Now this one is um, very powerful, it helps you uh, sort of ground objects that are shadowed, um, can really help add realism to your scene. And uh, so I'm just going to quickly search. SSAO. Oh, yeah. Screen space. I was going to, oh, let's not type that then. Ambient occlusion. There it is. Um, I was going to write SSAO and SSR, but I was like, that just, it didn't look like right on the text render actor. So I just was like, let's just write it all out. But uh, there is an acronym for it. Oh, wrong, wrong. There we go. Cool. Now, as you'll notice, uh, I've actually, like the screen space reflections, I turned off uh, screen space ambient occlusion. Um, so it's not really visible. But when I go in here, you'll see it sort of pop in. Yeah. Um, and what I can do is, I feel like it's been down res here or something. Um, what I can do is I can increase the power of it. Now, this is, you know, obviously you don't want that super intense effect. But you can change it so the radius is in world space. You have all these awesome sliders to basically control ambient occlusion. Uh, now, the thing to keep in mind here is that it is screen space. So if I turn away, um, you know, that ambient occlusion is not being rendered on that object, uh, or at least, at least not visible, right? So it's, it's pretty efficient. Um, it's a good way to uh, handle uh, and control ambient occlusion um, in your scene. And you can combine this with the baked ambient occlusion to really get you know a, a very defined uh, AO term, and you can even control that stuff through materials. So there's a ton of different ways to control ambient occlusion. Um, I like the SSAO method just because it's quick and easy. Um, but yeah, that's also a l not not too much more to it. Um, fool around with the settings like the other ones, and you'll you'll quickly understand it. Um, so this is the one that. I won't get in too much um, detail about. Um, and the Panini project projection one was one that I actually, to be quite frank, I didn't even know it existed until a few days ago when I was looking through and I was like, oh, we have this. So I'm not going to really go into that as much, um, but essentially just a high, high level overview. It's a way to, if you're working in uh, large FOVs, so I think the default camera when you're in the viewport is set to 90. Um, yeah, so if you go here, it's set to 90. If I work in 120 and I have these windows sort of over here and I have content, it's sort of, in a way, it's warping the projection and it, and it can distort some of the objects, especially the example um, on the documentation does a good job. But it essentially helps you map, remap your uh, warped projection so it is flat. Hmm. Um, and that's, that's a really cool, uh, much more advanced and you know, the technical explanation is much more advanced than what I just said, but there's a, <laughs> there's a paper on it. So if you really want to know how it works, um, you can look at that as well. Um, so that's the Panini projection. Now we're, what we're going to get into is um, the, what were we looking at here? Sorry, I lost my train of thought. There we go, custom depth. Yeah, and this is another part of, um, this is one of the things about the deferred render that uh, can have issues is uh, translucent sorting and sorting objects with translucency. And what custom depth allows you to do is essentially um, flag that object to be rendered in its own custom depth pass. And you can do all sorts of cool things w once you do that. And you can visualize that by, uh, so this, uh, what I've done with this little collection of cubes here, sorry, um, is I've flagged, so custom, oh. 
I've flagged render and custom depth. And you can actually write stencil values, 0 to 255, I believe. Um, and those stencil values, uh, like the custom depth pass, you can do a number of different effects on it. And depth, uh, depth information is really good for um, someone who does a really good example is Tom Lumen. When I first started learning about uh, custom, custom depth, depth, he shows you how to essentially um, do a ghost effect in, uh, like they do in Skyrim, um, when you have those ethereals walking around, where you see that they're invisible, and what they do a good job of, because it's, you just don't notice it, um, is that they cull out the inside geometry so you don't see the back faces, which adds really to the effect. And if you have ghosts, if you simply just slap on a translucent material on a third-person character, you'll see like the yeah. back faces of the character, and you'll be like, that doesn't look right. Why is he not ghostly? Because like Hollow Man. Exactly, like, yeah. Hollow Man, yeah. And uh, to fix that, you can <laughs> Amanda's <use> face. <laughs> oh. Scare you? Oh, yeah, that oh. movie was intense. Oh, man. <laughs> um, <laughs> But essentially what mm -hmm. Custom Depth uh, can allow you to do is um, cull out those inner triangles by rendering and uh, detecting depth of certain uh, uh, points on that object. So um, it's a very powerful tool, um, and I will show you, visualize, it might be somewhere other than, um, let's see, we got depth of field. Yeah, I think it's actually somewhere else. Uh, buffer visualization. That's what we're looking at. So yeah. you go to lit, buffer visualization, and you see custom depth here. And now you can see that it's the only object that's being rendered into custom depth. Now, sorry, that's a little crazy. Now what I've done is I've taken a post-process volume, um, added it, man, this is rolled all out, um, created my own uh, custom depth material, and um, all it does is kind of show you a different way to visualize it. So I've just taken scene texture, custom depth. I divided essentially the depth. So as you get closer, it has that like gradient fall off, which I'll show you. Cool. Um, cool. Yeah, you get close and I'm you'll see excited. it kind of gets, see it has a sort yeah. of white mm -hmm. into it. Um, and I can actually, there you are, let's pull that away. I can change the distance here at which it kind of has perceived depth. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, yeah, and uh, Custom Depth is another super powerful tool that uh, once you get really into post-process materials and you get really good at understanding how um, rend defer the deferred shader and uh, even the forward shader, how they, how they line up different passes and how things work, um, you can really use Custom Depth for a lot of cool things. Like um, there's one, there's an outline effect okay. where you look like just point your crosshairs, which seems to be a, it's a pretty common effect in games. Is that how they do it for normally, like, like, if I was hiding behind this chair, but you could see my outline. Yeah, that's yeah, it's exactly, yep. that's path. exactly right. Um, and, you know, there are, if it's a deferred render, I'm sure that that would be how they do it. Uh, forward shading might be a little different, but for the most part, yeah, that's how you do it, um, you know. And it's a really, a really cool way to uh, get all different types of effects. So, Look into custom depth more. Um, I actually plan on on that uh, outline uh, providing the Tom Lumen's uh, in, like quick start to custom depth. He just does a really great write up. So uh, shout out to him for helping me learn that. Yeah, I think he's had a lot of his stuff over on the Tom Lumen Zeef. Like just Google search Tom Lumen L O, yep. -O M E N Zeef. Yeah, I think if you think if you go to Google and type in custom depth on Real Engine, it's One our documentation, and he's like second <laughs> under yeah. there. So yeah, Tom's been doing a lot of great work. Thanks, Tom. If yeah, you're watching, yeah, thanks, Tom. The man. Um, <laughs> so yeah, uh, post processing in a nutshell. Um, it's a very powerful tool. Um, you know, it it look at it as layers. Um, figure out what you're gearing towards in regards to style. Um, what effects you actually are looking for, and have an understanding at least of each setting and how to control them using the tools provided. And I'm sure you guys will be making awesome visuals very soon. Yeah. Yeah. And share them with us. Yeah, please, please do. That's the most important part. Cool. Um, so, yeah. Anything else? Any questions? Yeah, what else? We got some things to come across here. I'll, I'll toss a couple of your way and then we'll, we'll shut her down. Okay. But yeah. yeah. Um, Let's see, there's a, please show people how blend distance works. I think that'd be useful. You kind of went through that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's so we're good there. just the blend radius yep. of the, yep. Mm -hmm. Cool. <coughs> and then, uh, so if there's an unbound box the size of zero pixels, will it disable everything? Just to clarify there, unbound means it's global. Yeah, right? so exactly. It's instead of disabling everything, scene. it's just everything. Exactly. There's no bounding at that point. Mm -hmm. too. You got it. <coughs> you um, got it. Are you familiar with uh, dot .cube, like 3D LUTs? Um, and if we support I, them. Relatively familiar, I do not know. Not sure. That I do cool. not know. 
if there are some of these questions that we can't get to today or that we can't answer, feel free to drop them in the forum threads and we'll try to follow up on them as yeah, well. Definitely so. get back to you. Uh, let's see. Who we had here? Oh, is the color picker new to 416? Uh, will it work the same way? I think we changed the color picker in 416, but it should operate mostly the same. I yeah, think it's mostly I'm just uh, visual ch visual change. I think it was the the <coughs> the color picker uh, in my time here. The color picker has had some evolution to take take part in, yeah. and it definitely has. Um, the color picker for the material editor sta it remains the same. Um, that that will be familiar to you. But the post process ones, I think the reason they transition is because they didn't really want a pop out window kind of in your face while you're figuring out colors. Mm -hmm. You want it to be in your face while you're messing with the slider, so you right. have a one to one relationship. It's built a little more contextual to what you've got as opposed to trying to hop. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So um, it's the same. You got cool. it. Um, let's see. Any of these usable with VR? I, I believe so, but they're mm. a little bit more expensive. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> there will be, yeah, that is something I actually didn't touch on as much. And there's a reason there's a mobile tone mapper in here, and there's, um, you know, mobile settings. Um, actually, here, I'll show you guys very quickly. So in the rendering settings, um, project settings, rendering as usual, uh, this very top part, mobile HDR, um, there are phones that just can't support uh, certain effects, and it's the hardware limitations of the phones. Mm -hmm. You know, the I have an Nvidia Shield that can crank out everything. I can basically run Unreal Engine on the Nvidia Shield if I wanted to. But we also have, you know, iPhone 4S. You know, it's just an older phone. It can't support certain right. things that we're coming out with. So, you know, you're you're gonna have to work within the limitations that you have. But there are, you know, the more expensive ones are like Bloom, Depth of Field. Oh, um, yeah, Bloom and VR. Yeah, is. Those, exactly. And th those are actually things that uh, uh, I was going to talk, and I, Zach uh, did a great job of covering for me on the getting started in VR. But he talks about, you know, there's certain effects that you want to avoid, especially in VR, when your entire, you know, self and peripheral is is in the game you don't want full-on bloom everywhere it, it can really give you a headache or you know make you even sick well dof specifically too when you're trying to focus on oh something yeah in particular. yeah you don't want yes did you run into much of this with yeah, uh, with you know working I with fun house i mean we're doing house. some of it but i i think a lot of times we left a lot of that Off. out <laughs> yeah um, you know, smart we would do we did some custom depth past stuff just yep. on like with UIs and things because mm -hmm. we wanted those to always show up yep. and so we sort right. of ignore yep. it and be like yes this is always in front. It's a good way to handle that in VR when you have a 3D kind of UI in your space you That's always true. need it to be there as opposed yeah. to clipping through other geometry. Like, oh, well I yeah. have a menu <laughs> but it's in the <laughs> table I can't, now. I can't <laughs> through the yeah, floor. Yeah, but so we, yeah. Uh, a lot of that stuff, and that stuff gets heavy. You talk about it being performant heavy. Yes, it, too. it, it does I mean get heavy. And you showed heavy. us the GPU profile, mm -hmm. and it was taking up such a huge chunk yeah, of that. Exactly. And, and when and you jump into VR, like you you're don't targeting have ten and a half milliseconds. That's like exactly <laughs> right. Yeah, you got to make sure you got the resources allocated to be able to afford that. Um, and that's another thing. Uh, you guys bring up a really good point when you said UI. Post processing isn't just used for you know doesn't have to be just used for effects. You can use it as a tool to uh, create layers, like we were talking about. And it doesn't have to be just visual. It's mm. a way to layer out UI. It's a way to layer out another uh, uh, mm. any anything that you don't want to either be involved in the scene or whatever it may be. You can essentially call like, hey, be on top of this at all times. Um, so it's a it's a really uh, sophisticated system once you start to understand the the versatility of the tool. Um, yeah, and I think you answered this one with a earlier question. It's like, why are some aspects of post processing disabled for Android? And it's a lot of it's because oh, of yeah. the, the hardware, yeah, what, hardware. What, it, what it can and can't support mm -hmm. at that time. Yeah, which is why you <laughs> see here, even um, we have the different types of anti-aliasing. Um, which can tend to be cheaper, but you know you can crank it all the way up to eight times, which will get expensive on a like we said, like a, a lower end device, Android or iOS. Um, and you know that those are things that you just have to keep in mind. And once you understand, especially when you're doing mobile, once you know your limitations and you start to work within those, you can really work around. Like you can fake bloom, you can do a lot of different effects, like. You know, it, baking static lighting is a great way to save resources and still you can have an emissive material that has, you know, almost has an, a bloom effect to it. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, that's, that's a great way to get around it. So, yeah. Cool. 
And we got one more in here that we'll get to. And again, if we didn't get to your question, feel free to drop it in the forums. We'll see what we can do there. Thanks, Nick Dardell, for hopping in and, and diving on some of these as well. Thank you, Nick. A um, little off topic, but do you plan to do more streams on your own channel? Uh, yes, I do, actually. That is something I need to catch up on. <laughs> and it was. Um, th that's, a, that's a good question. Thank you for who's ever inquiring. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, Sniper echo. Yeah, right? It's putting a little fire under my behind <laughs> um which is yeah I, I definitely do and um i was gonna i was doing them on, on thursdays and i think i might switch up the day just because like um thursdays are sort of already you guys have information being thrown at you i, I kind of like to do a different day so i have you know a clear <laughs> clear path for me to stream on yeah, um sure. so but yeah I'll, f I'll figure out the days and yeah i'll definitely get back on it Cool, cool. Plan on it. Looking forward to that. Let us know. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. We'll do. Tell the people. Yeah, I'll join the uh the what is it, the Discord. There yeah. we go. Yeah. yeah. The Unreal. Tell What's Chad. That? Yeah, we'll make so we'll tell Chad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Chad. Yeah. And we'd never forget about Chad. He's yeah. he's a nice sure guy. Never forget. Oh yeah. He's a super nice guy. How's he supposed to talk to you? Yeah. You right? <laughs> yeah. Chad had a lot of questions today. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, Chad. <laughs> All right. Cool. cool. Yeah. All right. Well thank you guys. I enjoyed it. Great. Th it was absolutely wonderful having you on. Thank you As very always. much for having me. Welcome um, again. We, you. Uh, we, and I speak for myself in the community. That's right, guys. <laughs> we're, we're happy to have you here. So, uh, well, yeah. thank you. thanks yeah. for joining. Go cool, cool. A um, few more things. Uh, again, don't forget to tune in on Tuesday for our community training with Celeste. We're really looking forward to yeah, seeing how that goes and hanging out. And we'll be in the chat and answering questions as we can help out and just get to see our community yeah. do their thing. Absolutely. So. And yeah. then uh, next week is our 4.17 release preview with yep. Mike Fricker on Thursday. So that'll, that'll be, be cool. We just had a wonderful a meeting busy, on that. Busy, busy stream. There's a lot of, lot of great things heading your way in 4.17. Mm -hmm. uh, we're bringing Mike back. It's been a couple releases since he's been here, since we've been a little, we are working on some great things. Busy. Um, but yeah, he's excited to come back on. We've got a lot to cover. It's going to be a great one. We're looking forward to yeah, it. Yeah, I'm excited. Four, 417, I can't. NDA and all that, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> It'll be cool. People, people can grab main and poke around. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah, you're right. <laughs> but yeah. Cool, cool. So don't forget to follow us on Twitch, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, all the things. It's been real. Oh, and one more thing I wanted to call out, too. Thanks to everybody that participated in the uh, Game Jam. We had over 120 submissions that we've yes. been downloading all day. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be... <laughs> downloaded all the games. Yeah. 120? Yeah, yeah. so... Wow. We're going to be playing through a number of those. Yeah, okay. I was telling Chance that it, it, it broke everything that I've been taught about the internet. It's yeah. like, don't download files from strangers and then zip them <laughs> onto your yeah. computer. I'm like, let me grab these 125 files. Yeah, so that's going to be good. We'll have, uh, following the Mike Fricker stream, we'll be having the results the week after that so uh keep an eye out for that we'll send out yeah, another reminder on those things too and uh, we got our work cut out for us it's gonna be awesome some of the pictures that were shared or live streamed from people like victor burgos thank you victor for just rolling through yeah. everything <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> immediately afterwards i don't know how you have yeah. the energy to make it happen monster. Um, He's a monster. but it looks like we've got some really wonderful content in there to, to work through so yeah that'd be fun thanks for making games guys yeah absolutely awesome thanks, thanks for everything sweet cool dude all right Rolling. We will catch you next time. Bye. See you guys. See you.